Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, The Do's and Don'ts of Influencing a Centralized Multi-Site Calibration System, co-hosted by ISA and BMAX. My name is Stacey Logan. I'm with ISA and will be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, in regards to the question and answer sessions, we will have two Q&A sessions today one 10-minute Q&A within the presentation, and another session at the end. If we are unable to get to your question during the first Q&A session, we will hold it until the final. To submit your questions, simply type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're viewing along with others at your site, please designate a scribe to submit your group's questions. Do not use the chat toolbox for your questions for the Q&A session. If you have miscellaneous questions for me, the host, submit those into the chat toolbox. Unfortunately, with a large amount of pre-registrants, we cannot open the phones for questions. If we don't get a chance to respond to your question or if you would like to discuss a topic in more detail with one of the presenters, please feel free to contact them directly. That information will be given at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who have just joined, please make sure you are on mute. Both your computer and phone microphones should be muted. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email I sent you today, or if you go to the top left-hand side of your WebEx screen, you will see a tab labeled Meeting Info or Event Info. Some of the instructions are included there as well. Also, once the webinar closes, a survey should pop up in your browser. You'll want to take a few minutes to fill out the survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. In particular, there will be a question about what topic you'd like us to, pre to present on for the next webinar. Please provide us your feedback. We want you, our audience, to help us determine what the next webinar should be. Additionally, this, video, this webinar has a video component. If you'd like to make the presenter's video larger, double click on the video and it will enlarge on your screen. Please note that once you enlarge the video, you will no longer see the slides. If you'd like to click out of the enlarged video screen, click on the button in the right-hand corner that says Exit Full Screen View. You can also enlarge the presenter's video screen while still seeing the, pr the presentation slides by sliding your right-hand panel over. If the video component isn't loading well for you, you may need to connect somewhere with better internet connection or connect your computer to a direct internet line. If you are listening in through your computer and you have a poor internet connection, the audio may not align well with the video. In this case, I would suggest that you dial in through the phone for a much clearer audio. Once again, those dial-in instructions are on the event info tab or on the confirmation email I sent you today. Now let me tell you a little bit about our presenters. With 18 years of experience, including developing and commissioning calibration solutions, Sammy has tremendous knowledge of instrumentation and process involvement. After attending the University of Applied Science and obtaining a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology, he spent time as a software support manager and product manager, building a vast and well-rounded resume. He is an expert consultant on both the technical aspects and the business benefits of calibration. Today, Sammy travels throughout the world teaching companies how to build and improve their calibration processes to meet company-specific requirements. Pekka has been involved in software development and implementation for the past 14 plus years, spending the past five managing calibration system implementation. Prior to that, he managed and executed software development projects for about nine years. He holds a Master of Engineering in Strategic Leading of Technology-Based Business from Centuria University of Applied Sciences and a Bachelor of Engineering in Information Technology from Old University of Applied Science. Today, Pekka manages the BMEX professional services team and provides technical support to BMEX customers and the sales team globally. Emmett has over 15 years of experience in the pharmaceutical, biotech, and medical device industry as an instrument engineer. His field specialty is calibration programs and CMMS implementation. Emmett's all-encompassing experience includes development of calibration departments and systems at large greenfield sites for leading pharmaceutical companies like J&J &J and Wyeth. He has also served as a consultant to various companies, advising them on advanced software technologies that are the best fit for their purpose and goals. Emmett holds a Bachelor of Science Honors degree in applied, in applied Physics and Instrumentation. 
Today, he serves as an application manager for e-calibration with Novartis, reporting to their Martin plant. Okay, let's get started. Now, before we do, I'd just like to remind everyone to please make sure that their computer and phone microphones are muted. We're receiving a little bit of feedback right now. All right, now I'd like to hand it over to Sammy to take it from here. Now I'd like to hand it over to Sammy. Okay, thank you, Stacy. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it seems like we have a nice group of people attending uh, from different time zones today. So good morning or afternoon, depending where you are located. And uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today. My name is Sami Koskinen, and uh, I work for BMAX. And I'm going to run through uh, just a shortly the today's agenda. Uh, you know, what are the typical drivers, business drivers, to implement such a, uh, uh, these uh, uh, centralized multi-site calibration systems? Then uh, learnings and key takeaways. Then Pekka will, uh, Pekka Vidanoja will uh, uh, present us how to manage these projects and the resources. Then we have a short uh, question and answer session. And then Emmet Farrell from Novartis will uh, share their story. So what were their drivers? How did they uh, um, uh, uh, create their business case? Uh, how did they, they implement it? And what did they learn uh, 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 in the, the, the project? And then finally, we have uh, another uh, short uh, question and answer session. And then we're going to conclude uh, our, our webinar. So all in all, uh, we expect the whole session to take around an hour. So let's start uh, with the do's and don'ts of multi-site calibration system implementation. So first, we will, uh, or I will present you uh, the drivers, the business drivers, and then learnings. So let's start with the, the drivers. So what really drives companies and people to implement these centralized calibration systems on multiple sites? Uh, typical drivers are regulation, quality, and then finally resources. So regulation. It is uh, still very often, uh, maybe perhaps uh, too often, uh, that the only driver is uh, uh, regulation. So fear of not being compliant and losing the business because of that is naturally a very powerful driver. Industries like uh, power and energy, they have their own health and safety regulations to follow. Oil and gas, they need to comply CO2 and NOx emissions. Uh, pharmaceutical, they need to guarantee the patient healthy by following the GMP law. All these regulations out there is developed to make sure the products and services we consume are safe for us to use. The next is the quality, and uh, quality goes hand by hand with the compliance and regulation. Uh, conventional manual processes, naturally, they increase the risk of human errors. So how do we uh, minimize these human errors in calibration? Well, uh, we have our quality assurance team to create the procedures which guides us then to have a second opinion and, of, and or approval to make sure we need set quality standards. Issues with the quality drives companies to find the new technologies to guarantee the quality. Then resources. 
So production losses push companies to keep maintenance shutdowns very short, and that normally leads them to add more resources to complete all critical maintenance and calibration activities. And of course, not, you know, these uh, cumbersome manual processes are not making things any better. Also, outdated technologies typically require special resources to keep those systems up and running. So, of course, then companies are constantly seeking methods and technologies to increase the level of automation and to enhance their existing processes. Okay, what have we learned from these projects? we executed together with companies like Novartis. Uh, there are key, well, I'm gonna go through the, the, the key learnings and uh, they are value, commitment, proof of concept, and then finally deployment. So let's start with the values. First thing you need to, to do is identify weaknesses and opportunities. One method to use and identify those is the called SWOT. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Once you have identified those elements, then you need to create a business case to visualize the opportunities. It is also highly recommended to perform a risk analysis and establish escape path for the project in case of emergencies. Remember also to build KPIs, your key performance indicators, to measure the value with the live solution. Then the commitment. Find strong business sponsors to support the project in good and bad. Make also sure that the, the sponsor has authority to unite your functional managers like IT, quality, and engineering. A lack of strong committed sponsor has been the main reason of failures. And also remember, involve your SMEs, your subject matter experts, and end users as early as possible. This is very important if you plan to have a smooth solution deployment to the sites later on. And uh, remember to watch out the snipers. They are the ones that try to shoot down your good ideas in any corners. What else did we learn? Proof of concept. By pressurizing your ideas, you will build then the credibility for the solution. So you should select a site that is open for a change and that has no too much politics to test your, your solution. Create a deployment template around your proof of concept and I create also change management policies in case adjustment are required when you are deploying the solution. Then finally, deployment. Most of, the, most of the resources are allocated by the end user. So remember, reserve enough resources. And collaboration between end users, your SMEs, suppliers, and possible third parties, it's very crucial. Studies also show that the 75% of deployments fail because of lack of resources. And be ready for the change request. They will come. And then if they come, remember to act. So, key takeaways, do, you know, 
you need to ask your quest the question, does new calibration process bring any value? It's very crucial to ask that in the beginning. Focus on defining your goals as is to be. Don't jump straight to the uh, features and functions. Remember to involve all the stakeholders and users early stage. Build the proof of concept model. And uh, also remember that these implementations do consume a lot of resources. And understand what is required. And then remember also then allocate those resources. Make sure you have a very strong business sponsors that support you on every step of the uh, project, especially when the process, you know, if there's a, any need for the, the process changes and then any change, uh, changes required during the project. And then finally, remember that the operational excellence come from within. So people are very crucial. Those were the things that I plan to present to you today. And I will hand it over now to Pekka, who will then cover the, the project, the implementation project, how to manage it, and then how to uh, manage the resources. So here you, here you are, Pekka. Thank you, Sami. And like Sami said, my name is uh, my name is Pekka Videnaya and I'm working in, in BMX as a professional service manager. And today I'm going to speak something about the implementation process and uh, then the few aspects about the implementation management and, and the resources. Few things about there uh, what you need to take in, into the consideration. But let's take let's first check what is the what is all about the implementation process in the in the multi-site cases as you can see that the multi-site implementation process there is a clear two different uh, streams project project related stream and, and the site specific stream and first if we can go and those those both streams need to be balanced otherwise the, the implementation as a total process will fail. But let's first discuss something about the, the project initiation. And the initiation phase in the in the project stream is is the is the place where the whole framework for the entire project is is established and the common target for the project is is defined. So that's the foundation for the whole project. But then what comes next is the, is the process blueprinting phase. And uh, in there, the common work procedures and, 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 uh, and the processes are defined. And it's, it's good to remember that it's, it's not possible to jump into the new system without defining the new process. So if you try to use the legacy processes with a new system, it will fail. And because this is this is a very demanding phase, this process blueprinting, this requires a significant resources from the project sites and also the, from the sites itself. And their site and their contribution is very crucial for the process blueprinting phase. And the input is gathered from the different sites and their users and the other cross-functional SMEs are, are, and their input is, is taken in use, like uh, IT, compliance, and quality uh, things are, are gathered to get into the common process. And also in the, in the process blueprinting phase, it's good to remember that this is still the phase where the process can be cancelled. So if we can see that, okay, now, now we don't know and we don't have a common understanding what needs to be done, we cannot make a, a compromises or, or cannot make a decision what needs to be done. So we can say that, okay, let's, let's not 
do it anymore. Let's cancel the whole project. But if we say that we are not canceling and we enter to the specification phase from the project stream is, and there is, this is a very, also very important phase where the other requirements and the solutions are documented. So it's, it's very important to ensure that all the parties understand the specifications and the functionalities which are described in the same manner. Otherwise, there will be a conflict and, uh, and the different expectations will cause a lot of problems when you are entering the different sites if the specifications what are made, if those are not understood in the same way. And then the project-related execution is then the actual setup of the system. So the, all the system components and, and, and the configurations are made as specified in the previous step. So now we can say that now the system and the project itself is ready for the deployment. But now then comes the site-specific actions. And this is also good to remember that the first site can be considered to be as a proof of consent. So that, that we are entering to the first site very close operation with the project team that, that this, what was defined, is now tested in a real use at the first time. And, uh, and the site-specific uh, site initiation phase is, is the step where the local deployment team is established. Of course, the local team has been involved in the project team, but now this, the resources are reserved for the local deployment. And here, here also the local deployment planning is done. R local work procedures are compared against the common work procedures. And if there are something that needs to be adjusted, those adjustments are done. And we are doing kind of a fit gap analysis that, okay, is the site ready for the new system? So that is the site-specific initiation step. That is a key answer where you need to find an answer that uh, are we ready for the new system and if the site says that we are not ready then we need to jump back and, and think about the more okay how we can come into that stage that we are ready for the deployment but okay let's see that then we are ready and we enter the site execution and uh, this is the phase what is where the, all the data, for example, the, the, the legacy data is collected, cleaned for the new system, and, and, and migrated into the new system. So, so this, is, this is the actual phase where you are setting up the system uh, from, the, from the instrument point of view and, and from the, uh, so that we can say that when the execution is done, then the site is prepared and ready for the deployment. And then in the deployment phase, software and equipment and associated documentation is released for the site, which means basically that the site user, they have an access, they have been granted to access to the system, and then they can basically start to use it. Of course, very key point here is that all the site users key users and regular users, they are trained in the deployment step so that they know what to, how to use the system. Otherwise, we are not ready in the operation mode. And of course, when we are entering the operation mode, system goes live. And then in the operation mode, of course, that is, that is what is our key and, and, and the main target in every site that system is in the operation more eventually. And that is where the project phase in that particular site is, site is finished, and the normal support and maintenance procedures are taken in use. So key things to remember from the implement, multi-site implementation process is that the first site can be considered to be a proof of concept site. 
So where the deployment is done in very close operation with the project team. And then later on, the site deployment steps are done for the each site. So they are copied and multiplied for the different sites. And when you enter in the sec second site or the next site, then you need to understand that the site deployment activities are adjusted between deployments if needed. So we are always collecting like a lessons learned that uh, that what went wrong, what went good, what went wrong, and then we are adjusting our our way of doing this. That it is okay to make mistakes, but it's not okay to make mistakes, same mistakes twice. And uh, and also when the site specific deployment is done, the project teams moves to another site until all the sites are gathered. So the project team, team is basically something what lives beyond the sites. And that is, there we can jump into the next topic, which is the resource management. Uh, so the, from the resource management point of view, the following things are central part in the initiation phase. Uh, Project resources, of course, and their availability is uh, essential. And also, the project resources and their commitment to the site-specific deployment is crucial. So it's, it's not enough that the project team defines the whole project and, and specifies everything and then expects that the sites do it uh, ind independently. That will not happen. So the project resources and their commitment is required for the east site. And this will also indicate to the site team that they will have support for the whole deployment phase. So basically they are, they are facing the new system and they expect that they get the support from the project team. And that's of course what the project resources are there for. And then from the site specific resources, so the resources from the all target site needs to be involved in the project uh, definition. Otherwise, they don't feel that it's our, it's their system with, when it is rolled into their site. And this will help them to understand what, what the new system and the process is all about and gives them opportunity to provide input. And eventually, this leads to the higher commitment and it will make site deployment much more easier when they, they already feel that this is our system what is now rolled into our site. So key points from the, from the resource, uh, in resource management in the initiation phase that site resources and their commitment to the project is vital project resources and their commitment to the site deployment is vital. So it goes vice versa. And then if we think about the second thing regarding the resource management, it is about the planning. What you need to take in a, uh, into consideration when you are planning a resource management in the multi-site implementation. So the project resources and their availability, like said already that they are required to be involved in the every single site specific uh, deployment. So you need to make sure that you have enough project resources that they can support all the sites. And if you are doing uh, multiple uh, implementation or deployment at the same time, then the project resources and their availability is a very key point what needs to be taken into account. So, so the project resources needs to be shared so that, that every site gets an attention. And also the site resources. It's also good to remember that uh, they are vital for the actual deployment of course and, and the project definition. but, in, but if we can think about that the project resources are, are typically something that they are just reserved for this project. That, that is their main work, what they do. Site resources is typically completely different thing that 
they have already their, their, their daily normal work, which needs to be taken in account that if you are thinking about that there is a, a maintenance shutdown and you are thinking about I can do a, a project deployment at the same time, that will not happen. The site resources, their focus is somewhere else if it's in their uh, in the in the biggest effort in the whole year, and you are thinking about that you can do a deployment on that same time, so that will not happen. So make sure that the site resources are available when the deployment is coming. That that the, the management gives them uh, so much uh, spare time that they can do spare time from their from their normal duties and. And the third topic regarding to the project management is the, the system life cycle. Now we are saying that, that uh, we are rolling out a new system, and uh, this system has also a life cycle. And this life cycle needs to be taken in account when the resources and the deployments in the multi-site cases are, 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 are planned. So it's, it's not recommended that you uh, think about that I'm doing a site deployment during the same period when the system lifecycle activities are, are planned, because then most probably the project resources are the same guys who are also taking care of the system lifecycle. So then they are already reserved from the some other thing. And of course, there is always something that with, which might overlap that there is there is something what you don't you you were not able to take in account in the beginning and there is a there is a surprises in the system life cycle activities so don't don't plan a, a site deployment on the same time when the system life cycle activities are are done so the so the high level planning is something that the, the project uh, resources and their activities, site activities are aligned and, and synchronized with the system life cycle. And this is the key key to success that if you are able to align everything, and, and of course the project manager is the person who, who sees over these activities. Okay, what was the key takeaways from the process Point, uh, process point of view and also for the resource management point of view. So the multi-site implementation is a process with a section, sequential steps. So it's, it's not a basically, it's not a rocket science. There is a, just the steps what you need to follow. And uh, if I want to take something to highlight some step, that, that will be the process blueprinting. It's the most significant step in the project phase. And, and also good to remember that the site implementation process steps are adjusted according to the site specific characteristics and repeated for the each site so so that you are basically fixing the model how you are going to do and what is done inside the steps depends on the site itself but the model what you are rolling out for the each side is basically the same. Only the content, there will be uh, some adjustments. And also the site resources and their commitment is, is the key to successful project. And the project resources and their commitment is the key to successful deployment. And again, the project manager establishes and coordinates high-level plan for the project resources sites and their activities and system life cycle. So he's the man who, who oversees everything. And that's basically what I wanted to, to tell you about today. And I think that now it's time for our first question session. Thank you, Paka. Okay, we're going to have our first question answer session now. 
What is the major justification for a centralized calibration system versus facility-centered calibration systems for companies with geographically widespread and extensive assets so long as the results go into the same database in the same format? Yeah, maybe I can take that. Um, I think that, you know, that, you know, the key element here is the, the harmonization. Uh, and uh, when you are able to harmonize everything and then, you know, then typically you can create the common KPIs. So you can even then share your learnings between the sites and then even compare how they, how do they operate. Uh, uh, and uh, I think those are the, the key things and justifications to centralize your system. And then there are, you know, some some other, you know, um, 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 minor things like uh, sharing your licenses, um, maybe even sharing the resources. It gets easier when, when everybody uses the same system. But I would say that the harmonization and common KPIs. Okay. It seems that the in-test level is usually strongest in the individual sites. How do you promote the implementation of the latter so that there is a sufficient resource level and a consistent implementation team across sites? Uh, I think, again, you know, the strong business case. Uh, I think that's the that's the way that you are able to then commit your resources. Uh, you know, return on investment. Uh, and then proof of concept. Uh, you need to have that proof of concept. And that shows you, this, you know, how much uh, the new process will save time and, uh, and that makes your business case stronger. So that helps then when you go move to deployment, you know, then resolve those resources because there's evidence that it brings the enhancement and it brings the value. So the strong business case. Okay, our next question is, I am interested in multivariate calibrations or optical spectroscopy, sorry. How is this different or the same as other calibration projects? Well, I have to say that I, I don't personally know that, you know, like you stated, even hard to pronounce the optical spectroscopy. So I can't answer that. Uh, Pekka, you have anything? I, uh, basically, I, I don't know the subject so or, or that, that particular case so well, but I, I don't think that it's, uh, when you can follow the same model is is that it should be so that, that, that the model what you are doing whatever you are doing inside the model it doesn't matter so so basically it should be the same as as the other projects when when you have a model in place that you can copy and, and do the same elements so it should not be different than the others I might just chime in on that one also, um, just to to say that uh, just to uh, agree with you, Pekka, that um, you know um, the the system is, should be designed to to handle any type of calibration or any uh, device that requires calibration. Um, obviously, depending device by device, you may have to compromise, um, you know, the the capabilities of your system, but. Um, Typically, uh, the management and the uh, control of, of, of all devices should be captured in, in, in a similar uh, fashion. So you generally wouldn't be discriminating by uh, device types. Okay, Thank and you. then our final question. Sorry, go ahead. Now go okay, on, Stacy. Okay, thanks. Our final question um, for our first Q&A is, ushering in change is always difficult. How do you manage the human factor or what you refer to as snipers? I guess I was referring to those snipers. Uh, well, this is, a, this is always a, you know, 
it's a challenge. Uh, we human beings, when when we get used to our phone, it's even hard to change the phone. Ch changes to the processes, it's a it's a it's a challenge. Uh, and uh, I would say that you have to just, um, you know, when you implement anything, uh, you know, this kind of a system, you have to show the value every and one uh, and all the individuals that are involved in the project. So you you simp simplify things so that everybody understands what we are doing. And I think that's the only way, you know, every every opinion is uh, is important but you have to then be ready to then show the value of the system the new system emmet i think yeah, you probably have also some experience of you know how do you manage the uh, human factor here yes um I, I think again to echo you sammy the um the the key thing is I think communication early and uh, to put really, I think, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, I, I think really to put a core projects team together that will be common to the deployment for, for all facilities, but then to make that contact early in the project for the deployment for those sites and to uh, include your, your super users or your power users um, and your end users at the site early in the deployment, um, and and really, it, it you know it's something I'll speak to later on as well. But it, it really it, it it makes it a positive project as opposed to one that people are pushing against. Yeah, exactly. I I fully agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for those questions. And remember, if we didn't get to yours, we will hold it until the final Q and A. Now, at this time, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Emmett. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emmett Farrell. Um, my, I work uh, currently work for Novartis. Um, by way of introduction uh, to Novartis as a company, for those who uh, are not familiar, um, I said I would lead out with a slide with just some basic facts about uh, Novartis. Um, you know, Novartis is a global, a truly global pharmaceutical company uh, with more than 90 facilities uh, worldwide. Um, the the company has uh, a, a few different focuses, um, you know, and a few different divisions. Those primarily being uh, the Novartis uh, companies themselves, the Novartis brand, uh, primarily focusing on uh, pharma, biotech, and uh, medical device. We also have the Alcon division, which is uh, focused around eye care. Uh, products and uh, also the Sandals uh, division, which is uh, generics. Um, so the company does uh, employ uh, more than 100,000 people. So it is it's truly a, a very very large uh, company. And uh, again, as I go forward and and, and take this case study um, uh, to you, um, just to to uh, reiterate this. Where we're coming from uh, with Novartis is from a pharmaceutical background. So, um, <clears throat> industries like uh, other large industries like oil and gas and um, other types of industries, while you may not have, uh, you know, I think you'll see a lot of common themes, but obviously we, we, we work to some different uh, regulations as well. But uh, I think you will see a lot of commonality in what we, what we talk about. So uh, Sammy earlier talked about drivers um, and uh, what, what drives a company to uh, implement a centralized system. And uh, again, there was a question earlier about a centralized system versus uh, a common system but maybe deployed at, at individual sites. So um, again, um, there will be a lot of, uh, I suppose, duplication in team between um, what's come before and what I'll talk about. Um, but uh, I suppose one of the key drivers for us uh, is uh, regulations. Um, so again, as a pharmaceutical company, we're very, very highly regulated. Um, but you know, again, most other industries also have uh, regulations, whether that's health and safety or um, you know whatever those other uh, regulations are. Um, but for 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 the pharmaceutical world, uh, we're very controlled by uh, 
typically like the FDA would be one that most people would be familiar with. But usually each country um, or each part of the world would have a regulatory agency for, for pharmaceutical products. And so it's really a, a big driver for us to uh, ensure that we're compliant with these because um, non-compliance, uh, you know, for, for, for any regulation uh, is usually very costly and, uh, you know, also uh, ethically not the, the thing to do. So um, <clears throat> really around uh, quality and regulation, um, we've seen in the last number of years um, that, you know, the modern computer systems now that have come along have allowed us to move from old uh, procedure-driven uh, compliance uh, to, to, to systems that have compliance built in. So, you know, um, really in the past where procedures uh, specify what people should do um, and, and people have the option to follow that procedure or to not follow that procedure. Um, but with some of the modern systems, uh, that control uh, is taken away and uh, the compliance is really built in from the ground up. Now, that's a key attraction to, to some uh, companies. And uh, again, uh, the, the, the last point to make uh, around this, and again it echoes a part of what the question was earlier on, um, is that you know a single enterprise-wide standard solution, it, it really does bolster quality and it, it reduces risk. And I suppose these are two things that, um, that, that are really central as a, as a driver for a company. Um, so where, where you may have a, a common system deployed at multiple sites, um, you'll find an awful lot of redundancy, and you'll also find that uh, having that level of autonomy uh, for each site may uh, lead to inconsistencies. So even if you have a common uh, platform, you may have inconsistencies about how it's deployed and how it's used. So with a standard system that's being used across multiple facilities, uh, you should be sharing the same procedures, you should be sa sharing the same workflows, and uh, that really ensures that you move as one company and as one uh, division and that everybody is doing the same thing in, in every location. So that, that's a key driver uh, for, for a company like Novartis to, to, to move to a centralized system. The next driver, again echoing uh, Sammy's uh, topic uh, earlier on, is what we call system control or process control. Um, and maybe Sammy mentioned it as the quality of the calibration. So, you know, really what we're talking about here is the, the benefit, you know. So really, we need to reflect, um, sometimes in the pharmaceutical world, we, we get very focused about how calibration is a quality function, it's there to protect the product, it's there to protect the patient. And, and these are very true. But it's also, you know, from a process perspective, a very, very beneficial uh, aspect and um, you know we're not we're not doing it for no reason we're doing it to improve our process uh, to reduce our downtime and to uh, optimize uh, you know our product you know to, to reduce waste so you know in, in the past a lot of calibration requirements were, were defined to you know generic standards or you know um, you know simple procedures you know so um, with, with these new systems that are available we're able to actually take the data you know, that, that's produced by a calibration and enter it into a system where we can analyze that and optimize our maintenance and our, our calibration, uh, you know, um, uh, frequencies and our tolerances and, and really make, a, you know, a key thing for us really is, you know, to make data-driven decisions. So we, we really want to uh, use the power of these new systems to drive process optimization and to minimize uh, process downtime and to make you know, to make a better product and to reduce waste. Um, you know, so historically, uh, you know, historically these uh, paper systems have been quite wasteful. And you see there our, our, our poor person uh, trying to climb a mountain of paper, you know. So as, as we move uh, forward, I'm sure that will be familiar to a lot of people, um, you know, as you move uh, forward, that will be echoed several times. The third driver that we want to talk about again is uh, cost resources uh, on multiple fronts. So, um, you know, anyone I think who works in calibration will tell you that calibration is expensive. Um, it's one of the first things I learned when I went to work for a calibration company is that, you know, calibration is expensive. So whether it's 
uh, hiring people. It's a very labor-intensive task. Um, the equipment required to, to the standards that are required to be purchased, these are all very expensive. But even probably more than all that, the process downtime that's required, you know, for, for, uh, for, for calibration windows is, is expensive as well. So while your equipment is not running, you're not producing products. So, you know, again, we, we go back to the, the same uh, discussion about, you know, the shotgun approach to uh, defining uh, calibration intervals and calibration tolerances. So, you know, it's very simple for somebody to write a procedure that says we'll calibrate our temperature probes every year, once a year, um, and we'll use a, a generic tolerance of plus or minus two degrees because that's okay and we shouldn't have any problems with that. But, you know, we were really looking for an option that would really say, you know, uh, you know, well, what should we be doing based on, you know, what's the instrument really capable of? And uh, until these systems were available in the last number of years, you know, that, that, that really was a, a very difficult and very time-consuming, uh, you know, uh, process to, to define. So really what we searched for is a way to, to uh, define these based on the data that's, uh, that's collected during the calibration and uh, also to try to uh, optimize our system and integrate our system uh, with the maintenance team as well so that maintenance and calibration can potentially be performed on the same equipment at the same time or in the same downtime windows. So that rather than coming to your production uh, team and saying, I need a day of downtime uh, every month, um, you might be able to say, I only need one and a half days every three months. And uh, you know, these, are, these are very significant uh, cost savings. So the, those were all the reasons why we wanted to do that, but you have to prove to the business that there will be a saving there. And uh, for, for Novartis, that was, that was something that we, we had to define, and we, we constantly have to define it. We constantly have to prove that our business case is valid and that, that, uh, that our system will, will be effective and, and uh, cost effective. So we, 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 we searched for a system really that would allow us to, uh, to uh, optimize our, not just our, our calibration activity, but the whole process around calibration. And uh, as we looked through just one division in our, in our company, we found that we had 700 calibration procedures across the company, um, across the division, I should say. And, uh, you know, as we, as we looked at the system, we said, well, that's because everybody has their own system and everybody wrote their own procedures. Whereas as you centralize, uh, you, can, you can share those procedures and those workflows. Um, so again, we wanted to uh, harmonize our maintenance and calibration windows. Um, and we also, as a company, wanted to optimize and take use of the latest technologies that are available. Um, the Foundation Field Bus technology, where we use that, um, has been a very powerful tool for, for calibration um, because it can really optimize our technicians' time. And uh, you know, that was something that we were keen to take advantage of. But I suppose a key point uh, really to talk about in your, in your business case is that you, know, you can't really take the short-term view in terms of you know, pro project cost. Uh, you need to take a look at total cost. So you know, you know, will your running costs over time be, be cost-effective? Um, and what will your productivity and your headcount uh, impact be? Or will you have any positive uh, impact? So these were things that were considered in, in their entirety and um, you know, these are things that we've, uh, we have seen benefits in and these are things that we continue to, uh, to improve upon. So in terms of the system that we chose and the way we, we, we chose to design that system, uh, we, we chose what we call uh, an integrated calibration uh, solution. Um, it's integrated both from uh, a software perspective but also from a hardware perspective. Um, so we, we have integrated on the software side our engineering design tool as well as our maintenance tool and our calibration tool together. And uh, that, that allows us to incorporate uh, the, the, the calibration asset from uh, cradle to grave, as we call it, the complete asset life cycle. So really within the engineering design tool, the, the, the design engineers are able to uh, specify equipment and uh, you know, provide all the details around that equipment and then without 
recreating that in a new system, uh, it's able to be transferred into our uh, scheduling system and then also uh, transferred into our calibration system. So the systems are integrated together so that we have reduction of, uh, of duplicated effort or actually as much as possible elimination of duplication of effort. So we create that data once in one system and then it is, it's cross-platform at that point in time. We've also integrated on the hardware side of things. So our, our, our calibrators that we use also run the calibration software and they're able to um, you know, capture the data for the calibration automatically and to upload that into the system. And that goes back to what we talked about, uh, taking, the, taking the, the, to a certain extent, taking the human aspect out of the, the calibration um, and uh, you know, some of the failings there that come from people um, you know, we really, uh, uh, it really improves our quality of our calibrations. So the, the system that, that was designed really, it uses uh, a few different tools, but they're all optimized and integrated to give us the best overall solution. Um, again, to echo uh, Sammy's, um, uh, Sammy's points and uh, uh, Pekka's points about the implementation, um, we chose to do a proof of concept or a pilot site first. And uh, we selected one facility for that um, to develop our final solution. And uh, we, 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 the site that we selected was, you know, it was a ph pharmaceutical plant. Uh, we had some foundation field bus in place. And uh, what we chose to do was to really utilize the, the expertise on site and to, um, you know, use that as a test bed to develop the the business processes, the blueprinting that, uh, that, that Pekka mentioned, and uh, to develop the, the, the system and fine tune it. And based on the, the lessons from that, we developed our final e-calibration system, and uh, that's the system that's uh, in use today and which uh, we, we make available to our other facilities as they choose to come on board. So, as we roll out, um, you know, we, we've rolled it out to multiple sites at this point in time. Um, it's not in use in all of our sites, um, but we make the option available to sites as they as they uh, as they look to upgrade their their calibration and maintenance management system. So, um, you know, to echo again the guys from earlier on, um, you know, it's not just receiving a new calibration software package, um, and and this is where we. We, you know, again, we got the question earlier about, um, you know, making it successful and uh, not alienating individual sites. And uh, I, I think really, you know, it, it really uh, falls back to where we've seen successes where uh, we use a, a dedicated uh, deployment team and um, as well as that we involve our um, site users and our site super users uh, right from the start. and. Uh, those people become key during the project, but also ongoing. And uh, we've found the most success when um, we found the most success when those people are really involved at the start, because you know they they're, they then feel uh, included. They see the positive aspects of the system from the start, and um, it, it makes it a positive force. You know, it becomes a positive change as opposed to a, a change that people fear. Because all, all of these uh, site super users, you have to bear in mind, they're experts in their own right, and they've designed their own systems. So if a, if a central system is coming to replace that, there, there will always be some uh, resistance to that. Um, but you know what we have found is that where you know where we really uh, get in early and uh, and and, and uh, include those people, um, you know we get great uh, ideas and we have the, the fewest issues. Um, and that's really been borne out um, within Novartis, but it's also been borne out in my experience as well with other companies that uh, it, it really is, uh, Pekka mentioned it as a, as a key takeaway, and I would have to mention that as well. <clears throat> you know, include your users uh, as early as possible and um, <clears throat> use them to, uh, to be a positive force for the change when they bring in this system. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, we, we haven't uh, rolled out to all of our sites, but we have uh, we have a, a solid platform now from which to springboard forward to, to additional sites. 
Uh, at present, for our, our e-calibration system, uh, we have more than 300 users on, this, on the system, and uh, we're in use in uh, seven different facilities across the world, um, from the west coast of the States to Japan. And we have uh, several sites in uh, Europe as well that are also using the system. So um, it, it's um, uh, really been uh, successful in the, in the sites that are that have been onboarded to date, and we, we look forward to, to rolling it out to, to sites um, in the future. <coughs> so having, uh, having implemented, uh, what lessons did we learn, and uh, what takeaways did we get? So I suppose, you know, we, uh, I mentioned, you know, the business case at the start, and uh, as, as we push to, to roll out to more sites, we, we, we have to keep uh, you know, redefining and, and uh, proving our our, uh, our business case. Did we did we get what we wanted out of it? You know, does it make business sense? So, you know, we have uh, seen uh, significant uh, improvements, um, and uh, these have been borne out by uh, surveys that have been performed by the sites that have uh, that have come on board. And we have seen, uh, you know, reduction in calibration uh, tool time. We've seen uh, administration head count. Significantly reduced. Um, think of the think of the amount of people involved in uh, handling, you know, 10,000 calibration certificates. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of administration involved in that. So, as you move to a paperless system and as you move to an integrated system, that that goes away. Um, it goes significantly reduced, I would say. Um, as the, the 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 question came about the uh, optical spectroscopy, uh, I imagine there will always be some paper involved. In any system, um, but our system is designed to handle that paper um, as efficiently as possible um, and to minimize it. So we, we, you know, where where a system can can handle that uh, a paperless activity, it does. But where you're forced to deal with a with a, a paper record or or a third party record, our system handles that as well. So um, we 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 we've seen, like we say, significant uh, significant productivity gains from our technicians. And uh, the, you know, like we say, the administration headcount can be uh, redeployed to other tasks. So the other key uh, improvement that is is very difficult to uh, to quantify is you know uh, you know how much does it save you if you don't have a, multiple procedures or or how much does it save you if you have a more compliant system? You know it's difficult to put numbers on these, but I, I call it the being able to sleep at night factor, you know. So we're, we're doing the right thing. We're improving compliance. And we're reducing our risk from regulatory uh, inspections, and um, you know we're we're uh, we're seeing all those positive uh, fringe benefits uh, from from uh, the system. The other the other uh, key benefit to the system is that as we move forward and with more and more data captured uh, in our system. It allows us to share that data. Um, you know, so a site in Singapore that's being commissioned can leverage data that's been uh, in Switzerland for um, you know a number of years. So as they design a new facility, they can say, you know, which devices have the best track record, and then they can select those and design those in from the start. Um, you know, a new facility that comes on board, how long does it take to develop procedures, calibration procedures? And, and to implement calibration programs. You know, the system is already there. You don't have to redesign it. You don't have to rewrite procedures. You really just need to hit the ground running and get going. So, you know, that's a really key, powerful function of having a centralized system. Um, and it's not one that should be taken lightly. It's, it's, it's a huge, huge benefit. Um, and the, uh, the final aspect that I'll leave you with as well is that this system that captures um, our, our data, you know, allows us now to, you know, move from, like you see the pictures there, from the paper handwritten records to, you know, the data in an electronic format where we can query it, we can analyze it, and we can optimize our frequencies and our tolerances based on the device type, where it's installed, make and model, and then really we can define the optimum um, uh, maintenance for that device. and. Uh, not just base it on uh, sticking your finger in the air and saying, let's do it every 12 months because that should be okay. Now we can prove those numbers. 
and uh, typically you see a significant reduction because t people are generally conservative on those. So that's uh, that's me. That's my uh, that's my bit. And like I said, I think we're moving on now to the questions and answers, the second questions and answers uh, session. Thank you, Emmett. Okay, if anyone has any questions, please submit them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It should be in the bottom right-hand corner. How did Foundation Field Bus improve efficiencies at Novartis? Emmett, I think this one might be for you. I'm sorry, I was just muting my line there. I, I believe the question was around uh, uh, Foundation Field Bus. Yes, how did Foundation Field Bus improve efficiencies at Novartis? Okay, so, um, you know, uh, the, the calibrators that we use allow us to query the, 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 the bus. So, uh, as we do the calibration with our process calibrators, um, you know, uh, you're, you're in the digital world there. So. Uh, the, the calibrator is able to query the bus there and then at the instrument, at the, at the output from the instrument. So in, in the past and with other technologies, you may need somebody at a, at a control screen or you may need a second person involved to relay readings from a different location. And uh, something that we've, we've seen is that where the, the, the foundation field bus can be utilized uh, um, to, to basically take all your readings right from the instrument and it really uh, uh, allows you know one technician to work alone, so that's that's something that we've uh, we've we've um, we've really uh, tried to promote where possible. Okay, you rolled out the calibration system to six of the 90 sites. What level of deployment would you view? What level of deployment would make you view this as a full success? Well, um, obviously, once we get to to all of the sites, but um, the sites vary in size and they vary in scope. So um, the the deployment would be a, a long and considered one to get to that point in time. And it really comes down to if a site has only 100 instruments on it, which some some sites may be, uh, it may not be cost effective for them to deploy uh, onto the, the the system. So uh, without specifying a, an exact number, um, you know, it, it really comes down to uh, each site uh, analyzing the business case to come on board. And sometimes the business case doesn't make sense for them. It may not be, they may not have the, the scale that would, that would uh, benefit from the system. And how long does it take you to deploy to a single site? Uh, it depends, um, I think, very much on whether you're migrating uh, from a, a previous system and what previous system you're uh, migrating from. Um, and I think probably the, 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 the vMix uh, guys can probably, they probably have vastly more experience than me on this. But we typically see, uh, depending on whether it's a greenfield site or a, uh, like we say, a migration, you could be in the three to six month uh, window, um, you know, including end user training. Okay, um, impact from a calibration error may cause an important issue. So at which moment will you care about criticality? So uh, criticality is built in um, to, to the system, so we're able to identify which devices are critical and which devices are, are not critical. Uh, obviously different industries have different definitions uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, people will probably be familiar with things like GXP criticality and, and things like that. Uh, we we, we uh, incorporate that into our system, and um, our, our system is able to promote prompt um, for um, you know approval and uh, and prompt for deviations uh, when when a failure is seen. And did you achieve any IT savings? Um, yes, so our, 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 our hardware is centrally maintained, uh, so we do not have to, you know, we do not have redundant IT costs. So that's part of, 
you know, that wouldn't be just for us. I think that would be seen for any any facility that chooses or any company that chooses to implement uh, a system like this. Um, you know, we use a you know, it's a, effectively a zero client, so uh, you know, there's no local install, and uh, basically, you know, uh, you know, our 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 hardware is centrally, you know. Uh, 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 centrally installed and centrally maintained, which is a very significant saving. The sites don't have to uh, have any outlay for that. When you were prioritizing sites for deployment, what was your main decision driver? Um, I think the sites themselves, um, you know, uh, the sites themselves, uh, generally speaking, uh, shout when they need to come on board. Um, there was an initial, um, like we say, initial pilot site selected uh, that was based on a, a business need to, to upgrade their CMMS, and uh, that's typically how it's been handled so far, is uh, within the division that we have deployed to um, the sites with the, with the, with the most need to, to migrate. And uh, then as we, as we are in the mode now, we're looking to uh, strengthen and prove our business case. Uh, we, we've been doing that and we have proven that and then it becomes um, easier to deploy it out to, to other facilities. Were there devices that you could not include in the system like balances and how did you handle that? Um, I think the, the, the guys again from Vmix can probably chime in on this but yes the system has some special functionality specific for balances. Um, so they incorporate all of the, 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 the testing modes for balances as well. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, uh, I mentioned it earlier on, I think, uh, slightly covered it. Um, there, there are some cases, uh, there will always be some cases where uh, you, you can't handle that functionality within the system, but uh, you, we, we do design it to handle the paper record when, it, when we do have to handle that paper record. Okay, is proof of concept synonymous with beta testing? Um, I don't know if you would, if you know, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't uh, consider it uh, beta testing. Um, the, the, the system was fully uh, deployed and fully qualified, but it was used as a, a, a pilot facility. So, um, you know, you could consider it beta testing, but, um, you know, it was really taken as, you know, a lessons learned uh, to optimize the system, but the system as deployed was, um, you know, fully functional. And I, I think, Emmett, uh, you chose to use uh, off-the-shelf products and then they were configured for you. Uh, so. Uh, it's not like a custom made for you. So mm -hmm. therefore, you know, it, it's been factory validated and then when you configure it for you, then it, you validate it for your use and your configuration. So you didn't beta test the, you know, the concept. Yes. Okay, how did you choose SAP PM instead of another one um, I think uh, SAP was was uh, in place you know long long prior to this so these are decisions that were made at a, at a company level you know prior to the the, the, the e calibration system coming in it was already the tool of choice so um, and the system that we chose was uh, capable to interface to SAP PM and that was part of the, the decisions for integrating are for choosing that system in the first place. Okay, great. Now, what cost do you have per deployed site? Uh, I think that would vary very site to site, and I, I don't think that's something that we could really go into to here. Okay. Um, when saving time, have you estimated per calibration and could you prove that in the end? 
So uh, in terms of time saving, uh, we look at the overall process from data capture and data build in the start right through to uh, time saved, um, tool, tool time saved and technician time saved. And uh, yes, we, we estimated those numbers and uh, yes, we have uh, proven those numbers uh, from, from our sites that have deployed. I, um, I should, let me just qualify that. We have numbers uh, from the sites post deployment that show that we have uh, time savings and uh, those numbers have been quantified. Okay, did you have network latency problems and if so, how were they handled? Um, we have had uh, some minor issues, uh, but um, you know, uh, typically um, our, our infrastructure team has worked very hard to uh, resolve those issues, and uh, uh, now we do not see uh, any significant latency issues anymore. Okay, which GAMP category did you drive for your validation approach? Um, this would be the, 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 the validation model used. So um, we followed the, um, uh, what's the term, the configurable off-the-shelf um, model, and uh, we performed a full, um, a full validation of that system. To the GAMP, uh, to the GAMP guidelines, um, I would have to look through the the project documentation to to, to get any more details. But it was uh, configurable off the shelf. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. If we don't have any other questions today, we're going to wrap this up. I just want to thank everyone for participating. These were fantastic questions. Um, oh, we have one last one coming in. Um, Emmett, are you using Citrix solution? And if so, how are you dealing with mobile device mapping? We, we are using Citrix. Um, and uh, we have some uh, device redirector software and um, you know, that's something again that if the, you know, without going into too much detail here, it's a very technical question, we can take it offline if that's, uh, if that's preferred. Yes, Emmett, I will give you contact information for that attendee who posed the question and you can reach out and you guys can discuss that in more detail. Okay, thank you again to everyone who participated. If you would like to discuss the topic or any others, visit BMEX at ISA's International Instrumentation Symposium, also known as IIS, May 11th through 14th in Huntsville, Alabama. And they will also be at ISA's Power Industries Division Symposium, also known as POWED, June 7th through 11th in Kansas City, Missouri. If you haven't registered yet for either of these, registration is still open. Simply go to isa.org for more information. Additionally, ISA and BMAX are co-hosting a free conference at ISA's headquarters on September 24th called Less Risk, More Performance, Best Calibration Practices Conference. Registration is now open, and you can register today at isa.org slash calibration conference 2015. If you missed any portion of this webinar or if you would like to watch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording along with additional links for supporting information. So be on the lookout for an email from me in the next couple of days. As I mentioned at the start of this webinar, I just wanted to remind you that once this webinar closes, a survey should pop up in your browser. You'll want to take a few minutes to fill out the survey and tell us about your experience at today's webinar. In particular, pay attention to the question about what topic you'd like to see us present for the next webinar. We value your feedback and we want you to help us determine what we should cover on our next webinar. This concludes the do's and don'ts of implementing a centralized multi-site calibration system webinar. Thank you for attending. We hope you acquired useful information and hope to see you again in one of our future webinars. <laughs>